Welcome to Delmarva today, Rick. Um, tell us about um, International Critical Incident Stress Foundation and uh, how, what they do and how you uh, came to be involved with them. Very good. Thank you, Hal. And I really appreciate the opportunity to participate today. Uh, and it's a great opportunity to talk about the foundation. So the International Critical Incident Stress Foundation began as the brainchild of a firefighter, a volunteer firefighter who saw that his peers were suffering, and he as well, from critical incident stress, exposure to extreme incidents. It can be a singular case or multiple cases. So he teamed up with a, a very renowned academic psychologist, and the two of them formed this foundation about three decades ago and are still with us, still operating, still teaching, and I'll, I'll tell you about why and what this is about. So uh, the intent from the beginning and still today was to help first responders primarily res uh, handle their their difficulties and cope with their exposure to critical incident stress. And some people refer to this as post-traumatic stress or post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, but certainly police officers, firefighters, paramedics, and EMTs face this on a regular basis. So what they created, these two psychologists, Jeff Mitchell and George Everly, created a model of peer support where colleagues will help colleagues through these tough times. And it's a program designed by these mental health professionals and others. So we now have about 50 different training programs. Uh, so mental health professionals guide this, but it is peers helping each other. And peer support has become widely known in this, in this uh, field of work for, you know, with first responders and others. Um, but this one is, you know, involves mental health professionals. So a peer will, ha will have that support and that help and that expertise from them. So what we do is we are primarily a training program. We offer 50 different courses that teach people the techniques of this critical incident stress management, as we call it. And we like to say that we are helping the helpers. So if you think of first responders as helpers, we like to say that we're helping them deal with what they suffer. And one of our taglines is we help save the, help save the heroes. The heroes save people who helps them. We have found over these years that this program helps just about anybody who has been exposed to critical incident stress. And there are many professions that are exposed to critical incident stress that you might not otherwise have thought of initially. Uh, uh, school educators and people involved with schools, of course, airline personnel, athletic trainers, dispatchers, corrections, on and on. Now, how I became involved, yes, yes, how? No, I, I was just going to say that I notice in um, your, uh, your classes or your, or your training sessions that you offer, you deal with um, pastoral uh, class intervention. Does that mean you work with ministers, clergy, priests as well? Yeah, that's a great insight on your part. We do a lot of work with with clergy, with uh, people who are spiritually based, with the chaplains for fire departments, police departments, and so forth, as well as mental health professionals and social workers. But specifically to that, there is an entire program and courses that we offer that look at the spiritual side of the struggles that people have with critical incident stress. And oftentimes the, the spiritual or, or uh, the religious side uh, of people's concerns or that strategy will really help people through a rough time. We all know that, that's not something new, but uh, in terms of critical incident stress, it really does, it really is a good strategy for a lot of people. It's very powerful. Um, for me, how I became involved, I was a career park ranger in the state of Maryland and rose through the ranks and became the boss, the head of Maryland State Parks. Did that for a long time. And 
during the course of that work, I learned early on in my career that we were exposed to every incident you can imagine. And frequently in remote areas where you didn't have a lot of help. And so park rangers and others, as I said before, other professionals, but park rangers face a lot of critical incident stress. So I learned about halfway through my career when I became the boss, that there was a program available that would help us with critical incident stress management. And that program was one that was created for us by the International Critical Incident Stress Foundation and by the very people I mentioned earlier, Jeff Mitchell and George Everly, and some others, also uh, Victor Welsant, who is a psychologist who works with us. They helped us not only through some rough incidents, but they helped us form a team, what we call a critical incident stress management team, that was peers helping peers, mostly our employees, who were trained by the ICISF, and then began to make a difference in our workplace. And I saw over the remaining part of my career, a total difference in the employees. Now they had a way of venting out, if you will, their struggles with critical incident stress, and it changed their lives. So when the opportunity came for me to go to the ICISF to help them, when I was asked to go there and assume a leadership role there, I felt it was payback time. The ICISF, through critical incident stress management, had made the difference in people that I considered to be my work family, the park rangers. I saw what it could do, and I was a great believer in it. They needed help, and if they needed help, there was no hesitation for me. As I say, it was payback time. Rick, you mentioned that help with their struggles is what uh, prompted you to uh, become involved in this. Uh, well, you were involved because uh, of the incidents that were happening in the park. So you were looking for a way to address uh, the response to those incidents. And, and, and you were saying that the staff uh, um, had uh, manifested their own struggles with dealing with these incidents. And I, and I would assume they are incidents of trauma is, uh, is what you're responding to. So in, in the park service anyway, how, how, and we'll talk about this a little bit later with, uh, with others, but um, how were their struggles, you call them, uh, manifested? What, what was happening with them? What did you see? Sure. Uh, well, I experienced plenty of it myself as well. And then when I became in a leadership position, I could relate to what people were dealing with because I had dealt with exposure to grossly disfigured people through death or injury, uh, accidents, falls, you name it. Um, you know, bike accidents, car accidents, people falling off cliffs, drowning victims, burn victims, and oftentimes law enforcement incidents where park rangers are alone facing some really difficult people and they are at risk for severe injury or actually do get hurt or uh, you know worried for their lives so how this manifests itself is people have no if people have no way to get this out to get this poison if you will out of themselves this demon that's haunting them they won't be able to sleep right they may self medicate through alcohol or drugs they won't have normal family relationships because when they go home, after the stress they're facing at work, they bring it home with them and they, uh, they just can't have a normal home life. They expect life to be perfect at home. No one's life is perfect, but they bring these stressors home with them. The family is aware of the kind of things they deal with, but they don't know entirely because they don't experience it. They are in life-threatening situations or literally trying to keep someone alive until help gets there. And I know personally that I've had people's lives in my hands in a medical situation without the right equipment, without much support, and I'm waiting for the help to get there and just praying that they get there before the person dies and that I can't save them. That, that haunts people, whether it's park rangers or someone else, that haunts them. And so there has to be a way and there needs to be a way to get that out. So how did you design, um, Rick, these first interventions that uh, you did with the staff? What was wonderful for us, and we were fortunate that 
this organization that I now work for was formed in Maryland, even though it's an international organization, the two psychologists who created it are from Maryland, they still live in Maryland, and they, we were lucky because right here in Maryland, we had this organization right in our back door and we became aware of them and they brought their program to us, which includes, uh, again, peer-to-peer -peer support, uh, early intervention, the incident occurs, and with a very short time, a day or two, people are there with those people who've been exposed to the incident and help them talk it out. These, these folks that have this training, whether it's peers or psychologists, or social workers, all of those, they know what questions to ask and they know what to look for. And they know how to help people not only get help immediately, but they know how to refer them. And that's a big part of our program, how to refer somebody to longer term care, to, to therapy, to support by a mental health professional. So this program existed, we were fortunate. And what they helped us do is create what would be called a critical incident stress management or CISM team that was primarily our employees. And this team would be um, activated whenever there was a nasty incident somewhere in the state. And one or more of the members of this team would go help people talk through this, usually it's more than one, would go help people work through this incident. And that is the best way that this model is delivered is through a team that will have a, what's called a clinical director, a psychologist or mental health professional assigned to the team that will guide them when they're having difficulty or will help them coach them through what they need to do to help their peers. So in our case, you'd have a park ranger or another member of the staff or multiple people um, exposed to a terrible incident. And within a day or so, the critical incident stress team would show up and meet with them and do some organized sessions where they talk, where they share their concerns. They are not required to say a thing. Uh, anything they say stays in that room, short of if they're confessing a crime or uh, you know about to hurt themselves or someone else, then they have to intervene. But uh, when you get in there and you start sharing what goes on, it comes out of you. The, the poison comes out and uh, you know, that stress begins to come out. Oftentimes you'd have people say, well, I'll go sit with them, but I don't have anything to say. And those people invariably will open up because the program is designed in a way to ask questions that are non-threatening, to give people the opportunity to talk about the incident. And when that does not, when it's not done, when people don't get this out of them, it can fester and it can last for years. And the next incident that happens that's remotely similar to it or very similar, it just gets worse. Now they're piling up on these things. So we were lucky in Maryland. We had this system right here. And I didn't know at the time that they were taking this, this system, this peer support system, all over the world. And when I arrived there as an employee, I began to learn more about that. But even during my tenure in the parks, I learned more about how they took this model everywhere. Rick, people obviously are, are very, very different. And, and some people uh, who have experienced trauma or witnessed trauma uh, or even participated in ameliorating the, the, the results of, of the trauma are, are willing to talk Others just kind of bottle things up and, and you know, don't, won't say anything about uh, what they have just uh, been through or experienced. What kind, and I hate to use the term techniques, but um, that, that might well be the best word. What kind of, of, of techniques does the team I uh, use in order to draw out people uh, who are, are reticent to talk about the trauma that they have uh, witnessed or experienced or worked or worked in, and and then how to keep the talkers from dominating, because I'm assuming these are mostly group 
sessions that you work in. Uh, there, and, and another uh, second question to that is, are there individual sessions as well? Yes, there's techniques that are both individual and group. Uh, and so it, it's a complicated answer to that, Hal. It's, our trainings last multiple days. So if you're gonna be trained in how to function on one of these teams as a peer supporter, you're going to have, depending on which course you take, if you take one that is focused on individuals, it'll last two days, two full, two long 10 hour days of training. And if you take the course that focuses on, in, on groups, on group sessions, again, two long days of learning those techniques. And then there are, as I said, uh, about 50 courses. So there's dozens of other courses that help you with specific topic areas. Um, but talking about those core courses that I just described that take two days each, uh, they will learn the way to have the dynamics with an individual or with a group that show support and understanding, that is a reassuring and calm voice that's non-confrontational, non-judgmental, and really sets the tone for an openness and an opportunity. It asks people to describe who they are and what work they do, uh, what did they encounter in the incident, what is it that continues to come back to them, how are you sleeping at night, are you getting your sleep, what have you done to react to this, to handle this, what bothered you the most as you get into this, you ask questions like that and people begin to open up. Now there will be people who won't ever say a thing and may never need to. There are some people who have a natural body armor that these sort of things just bounce off. There are other people that have a body armor that it bounces off, but sooner or later, like real body armor, it wears out. And all of a sudden, it all comes out. They've been piling it up. There are other people who are very open and can share this, but never really get over it. That can happen too. So what, a key part of the training and this is part of why it takes so long, is for the, the amateur, and that's what peers are, unless they're a trained psychologist or mental health professional, they're amateurs. It teaches them to know their limitations. And when you see somebody who needs more help, you do your best to guide them to therapy, to confidential therapy, which is protected when you're meeting with a mental health professional, and they get them in to see a professional. And that's sometimes where that clinical director, that mental health professional that's a member of the team, will help them with how to get this person to get more help. The pinnacle issue for post-traumatic stress, critical incident stress, is suicide or attempted suicide. And we have specific courses directed toward how to recognize those, those triggers and those situations. And... Uh, so what do you look for and what kind of things do they say and how to get them additional help? Um, and it's amazing how just these techniques and you learn these things, you, and as you get more experience, you know, when you hear certain things, you know, that's, that's an indicator. I did mention the word trigger, by the way, and that's a key part of this, that, that this program and others, that there are things that will trigger memories for people. So that's a question you can ask people, even if they clam up and don't want to say anything. Uh, if you can get them talking at all, what kind of things remind you of this incident? Are there sights or sounds or smells? And of course, if you know the incident, and let's say the incident involved a fire, and involved a fatality, and you say to people, what smells remind you of that incident? Oh, they open up. Oh, yeah. They do. Well, this you, is... Uh, this, this, this is just it sounds to me like it's really a crucial um, activity that you're participating in here. I want to ask you what kind of feedback do you get from the peers? Because when the peers go into a session with someone who has experienced trauma, they are reliving it for themselves as well. I mean, it does not end uh, for them. They, 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 I would say they are courageous 
in the sense that they are willing to uh, wade into these waters themselves. No question about it. Absolutely. In fact, in our trainings, we watch for and have strategies in place that when someone is in the training and they begin to relive or have triggers of their own, we help them cope with it. We've had people have to leave the training because they are reliving. So that can happen to team members as well. And it, I believe what they're doing is they're giving back, much as I said before, payback time. They're giving back because they have suffered this themselves, or they know someone, a loved one who has, and so they want to be there for others. So they have to have come to grips to the best of their ability with the demons they have from these incidents, and then help other people walk through it. But that, it would be naive of me to say, or not, you know, not open, open or candid, that people who are on these teams, when they, when they begin to share with other people the the kind of triggers that these incidents will create or the kind of pain it creates, everybody in the room can have tears in their eyes, that the, the peer supporters can be just uh, sometimes as upset as the people on the, that are on the receiving end of this. Well, you try not to have that happen, but you can't be entirely stoic either, or they'll think there's something wrong with that supporter. You want a colleague who understands. So you have to demonstrate that compassion without losing your composure. It's not easy. Well, absolutely, and, and, and it definitely uh, is not easy. The, the general population, I, I, I would suggest, is experiencing a great amount of, of stress right now because of the uh, conditions uh, imposed by the uh, vir uh, virus. And... Uh, the COVID-19 uh, is affecting uh, almost all of our of our society now. Are are you using or are you uh, in, involved in any kind of stress related uh, training activities with the general population uh, now? We are. Uh... We're an organization that does in-person training. Almost That's almost our exclusive delivery method, although we do have online courses and have for several years. Most of this, most of this kind of training and this kind of work requires demonstration of skills, interpersonal skills with other people. So we are quickly shifting to provide more of our things online. But on our website and links from our website, we are providing a lot of resources, uh, recorded resources, the same kind of thing we're doing right now, a recorded interview, if you will, handout materials, other things that will give people advice, solid advice, including messages from the three psychologists I mentioned, Mitchell Everly and Walzant, they're uh, included there. So we're offering that to anyone who needs it, certainly our regular clientele and constituency, but people from the general public, as you said, and, and correctly so, everybody is feeling some level of stress from this, some worse than others, of course. Um, so we're putting a lot of resources out there and every day creating new ones and taking some of our courses that are hands-on in-classroom courses and converting them to online as we speak. That's coming out as uh, soon as we can. But meanwhile, there's a lot of other resources available to people that we're creating. Well, let me shift. We, we only have a, co a couple of minutes left, Rick, but let me, let me shift to your personal life. How are you, uh, how are you dealing and coping with uh, the uh, pandemic that uh, we have on our hands today? Actually, personally, I'm, I'm doing just great with it, which, you know, it's uh, interesting because it's stressful for everybody, and I'm handling it to the point where I think I'd make a pretty good recluse if I had to, but I have a, a wonderful wife, and we are essentially quarantined together. Um, she shares custody of her daughter, so we have had her with us at times, uh, but we're doing just fine, and she's in the school system. She works in the school system, so that's a whole different level of effect upon her life and our life and but it's no accident we have used and i personally have used a lot of coping skills i've 
I had some gym equipment in my home, but I really turned it into a home gym as this was starting to happen. I'm, I'm uh, doing a lot of self-care and trying to keep a routine. So I'm not just dressing in sweats all day. Sometimes I dress this like I'm going to my office or a little nicer than just, you know, lounging around kind of relaxed uh, clothing, so to speak. So getting a shower, taking care of yourself, good diet, not too much TV. And other key things are staying in touch, reaching out to people that you can't go see, but also reaching out to people you haven't talked to in a long time. Just making contact via the, the mechanisms you have available to you, text messaging, phone calls, video conferencing, that's really important. I also have a very wonderful, loving dog, and I would advise people, if you are alone, if you're living alone, think about adopting a pet if you can, a cat or a dog. The shelters need that help. There's and, a shelter uh, I've seen on the news in Florida that has emptied itself out because of people adopting pets there. It's a really good idea, and you have to take that you know, as, a, as a strategy. You don't want to adopt a pet if you're not going to be able to care for it long term. When this is over or begins. No, it's a commitment. It is a commitment. You have changed their life and you owe it to them. Uh, but they can provide wonderful support, especially if you know your home's a little empty and you want that extra help. But if you practice these things, the ability to get along with whoever you're quarantined with gets stronger because you're using other coping mechanisms. These are wonderful uh, suggestions, Rick. Good, uh, good advice. How can people get more information about uh, the International Critical Incident Stress Foundation? The best way is to go to our website, and it's really simple. Just go to the initials of that name, icisf.org. International Critical Incident Stress Foundation.org, but just the initials, www.icisf.org. Another way is to search for us on Facebook, the International Critical Incident Stress Foundation, or other social media. We're on other social media. When you look, and a lot of people are using Facebook for interaction and communication, and so people will see postings that we put there, but also links to other articles we put there, and then the commentary is terrific and if you're looking for more you can use the people who comment there as a sounding board or to get more information and we are people we have people commenting from all over the world so you'll see somebody perhaps from Canada commenting about an article that we have posted or something we have posted and then you can comment you get that dialogue going and there again becomes that connection connecting to new people that you didn't know who can provide suggestions and information. Uh, so the website's a good start. There's easily found resources there and then social media. All right. You've been great. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we've got a really good program here uh, to air. And um, I'm, just, uh, I'm just really pleased to know about uh, the organization you're, you're running and um, and the kind of work you guys are doing. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Hal, for giving me this opportunity. If it wasn't for your email, it wouldn't have happened. No, I said that nice email you sent. Well, but you, send out, you send out your updates, and I always. Oh, yeah, no, I do that. You know? yeah. yeah, it's a way of connecting with you. I always look right. at it. And so this time I actually responded. <laughs> right. Listen, thank you, Rick. You're welcome. Take okay. care of yourself, please. Bye bye now. And you too. Stay safe. I will. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye.